As you all know, we are living in a world where 3.2 billion people are online, where 2.4 billion out of these 3.2 are online using mobile telephony, where we have 4.7 unique mobile subscribers, and where mobile telephony is now providing financial services, employment opportunities, locally relevant content, and perhaps, more importantly, identity to the most disadvantaged people. With this reality, we can't but embrace the notion that ICTs are not just merely a service, but a means to promote development and improve and save lives. So, over the next two days, we will explore and discuss the latest innovation approaches in using ICT in development evaluation. We'll explore the benefits of ICTs and how innovations in this field are, being, are a catalyst to bring about rural transformation. Our distinguished keynote speakers and panelists will share best practices from the development community and the private sector they will share how ICTs are spearheading development uh, and the importance on focusing on people and bridging the gender gap. We'll also address concerns in evaluation methodology related to the use of ICTs, concerns such as ethics of using ICTs, the possible impact of sampling bias, exclusion, data security, and privacy. We'll also address the crucial role of building capacity and scouting for local talent. My name is Roxana Sami, and I have the honor and privilege of being your moderator for this event. This subject is very close to my heart, and I must say that I'm so happy that my organization, EFAT, is being so proactive in this space. Given our full agenda, I would like to jump right in and introduce you to Mr. Gilbert Ongbo, the president of IFAT, so that he can share his views on the role of ICTs as we pave our way towards achieving rural transformation. Mr. President, you have the floor. Thank you so much, uh, esteemed colleague from the, from the high table. Um, dear participant, um, first of all, let me thank you for uh, inviting me to um, participate uh, at this uh, gathering. Um, I have to say that I'm a bit uh, jealous, i.e., I would like to spend the whole day um, given um, the importance of the relevancy of the, the, the subject. Unfortunately, we have uh, two um, similar events the, uh, the same week, so uh, one has to uh, uh, kind of uh, share the, um, the, the, the time. So let me uh, just uh, start by uh, welcoming you to um, IFAD uh, here um, that I'm, I'm sure uh, most of you um, have uh, um, been here before with all your expertise, be it from the government, um, be it from the, the UN system, the IFIs, and uh, other institutions, the academies, given that expertise uh, um, to get all of you gathered in one place, I can only be um, looking forward to a fruitful discussion on the role of the ICT for evaluation. As many of you um, know, I'm still quite uh, relatively uh, a new uh, comment to uh, IFAD. This is my second month. But over the past uh, few months, as I uh, have uh, immersed myself in the work of the uh, organization, and I have been, uh, I have to confess, impressed by its attention to monitoring and evaluation, both for accountability sake, but also for, for learning. Our director of the uh, Independent Office of uh, Evaluation, uh, Oscar Garcia, um, I'm sure is going to um, speak uh, to this in a few minutes. For my part, let me simply say that certainly it's important to know that money has been well spent. But it is also crucial, 
crucial to learn from what we do. If a project, a project goes off track, m and &E can help us avoid similar problems in the next time. And if the project is of a great success, m and &E can help us understand exactly why it worked so that we can scale up and replicate the success elsewhere. ICT have uh, a, a central role to play in this process. Not only these technologies can also contribute to successful rural transformation, but for us, focusing on rural smallholders is important to keep in mind that smallholders living in isolated rural communities can use mobile phones for banking. They can receive early warnings about changing weather through their phones, and they can receive reliable market information so that they can sell what they produce for more. Mobile uh, money services can help smallholders grow more, earn more, and be resilient to financial shocks. We at IFAD, we are now working to develop a more structured approach to ICT, one that can help smallholders, farmers, make the most of their resources and to support the overall rural transformation agenda. This is why in January, there was a survey of IFAD projects for the use of ICTs. And last month, we had a seminar on how to leverage ICTs for development. And it's also why we are meeting here today. Technology offers so many opportunities for development, but we must not be blind to the obstacles. In particular, we must find ways to address the divide between what we, as development practitioners, want technology to do and what technology developers are themselves interested in creating. One has to drive the other, not the other way around. ICTs for evaluation must be an important component of IFAD's overall ICT strategy. And I'm so convinced that your presence here today will help us move another step closer to, to that goal. Let me wish you a very, very best uh, success for those two days. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President, for those inspiring words. And indeed, m and &E can help scale up success, and through m and &E, we can also learn from our failures. That's something that perhaps uh, uh, we should do more of. Uh, and, and, um, and, and it's really reassuring to hear that IFAD is going to have a more structured approach, approach to ICTs uh, so that we can support rural transformation and absolutely not to keep a blind spot that technology should be part of the solution and it's not a panacea. And that's why it is important to think about what the smallholder farmers want uh, rather than just uh, pushing down technology on them. Thank you, sir. It's now my pleasure to introduce Oscar Garcia, who is the brainchild of this event, the director of the Independent Office of Evaluation. Thank you very much for organizing this event, uh, and, uh, and I'm sure everybody in this room is keen to the next two days of learning and sharing. So with that, Oscar, over to you.
Mr. President, <coughs> distinguished uh, representatives and <coughs> dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, a very good uh, morning and a very warm welcome to IFAD. It is a great pleasure for me and my team at the Independent Office of Evaluation to have you with us over the next two days for this International Conference on Information and Communication Technologies for Evaluation. Many of you have traveled long distances to share your experiences and expertise in applying new technologies to achieve greater development impact. I want to thank you all for your contribution to this collective effort. We will need such a collective effort to transform our world as envisioned by the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. Frankly speaking, it was about time for such a vision of sustainable development to take center stage in the international agenda. A holistic vision that, put, that puts people at the center and realizes that we can no longer live together if we don't, do not take the environment and the capacity of the planet to host us into account. A holistic vision that recognizes that prosperity and economic development are necessary, but necessary to all the inhabitants of the planet, and not only for the better off. Furthermore, Agenda 2030 offers the word an action plan that tackles head on the challenges of increasing inequality in aims to not leave anyone behind, neither women, children, youth, indigenous peoples, or other minorities. Finally, it is an agenda that understands that we are not alone and that no matter how big our country or organization may be, we need to work together in partnership to achieve collectively a secure and brighter future for our children and future generations. The new Sustainable Development Agenda is a call for action and a call for a transformative change. We cannot continue doing business as usual because the window of opportunity to act is closing. <coughs> the innovative collective action required must be based on robust evidence. As representatives of the United Nations, we cannot accept a post-truth word. We are gathered today among development practitioners from a variety of disciplines, and we believe that improved decisions, policies, and strategies, improved programs and projects that can transform and enhance people's lives should be informed by the evidence of what works, what does not work, and most importantly, by identifying the underlying reasons. Fortunately, there is a greater appetite for robust evidence to inform the design of new policies, strategies, and projects in the countries where we work. However, there is a big gap between the information needed and the information available to achieve the Sustainable Development Goals. In November 2015, the evaluation offices of the United Nations Rome-based agencies, WFP, FAO, and IFAD, organized an international conference on the availability of the Sustainable Development Goal number two, namely ending hunger, achieving food security and nutrition, and achieving sustainable agriculture. The event provided a number of insights. First, the SDGs are dynamic and interconnected. Thus, a focus on only one or two SDGs may risk losing the holistic approach. Second, there is no single theory of change for achieving the SDGs. There is a multiplicity of valid approaches depending on the specific context. Third, the strong focus on equity, social justice, and sustainable use of natural resources requires more granular data and analysis. Fourth, the SDGs are country-owned and require commitment and capacity to be achieved which entails adjusting the role played by international organizations. Finally, the SDGs, because of their multi-sector, multi-layer, and multi-stakeholder nature, require extensive collaboration for implementation. Evaluation has a key role to play for the implementation of the Sustainable Development Agenda. The global data architecture, as we will hear later today, reveals an even availability of data among countries. This is sobering, considering that what we cannot measure also matters. The interagency and expert group for the SDG indicators has classified them into three tiers. 
The first tier for which an established methodology exists and data are already widely available. A second tier for which a methodology has been established, however, data are not easily available. And a third tier for which an internationally agreed methodology has not yet been developed. Concretely, in IFAD's work, this translates into a lack of systematic data on food storage, food losses and waste. We lack data on the nutritional status of children, adolescents or pregnant women. Agricultural statistics suffer from limited funding and lack of consistency. For example, it is challenging to assess the percentage of agriculture area under sustainable agricultural practices. The percentage of agricultural households using irrigation systems compared to all agricultural households, or the percentage of agricultural households using eco-friendly fertilizers compared to all agricultural households using fertilizers. Similar challenges apply to a variety of SDGs. There is, however, a way forward that brings us to the heart of this conference. New solutions to these challenges embrace the fourth industrial revolution that is taking place before us. This revolution includes machine learning and artificial intelligence, open data, open source tools, access to big data, crowdsourcing, mobile and wireless communication, all of which were neither available or were not economical until a decade ago. ICT showed great potential in contributing to the quality of the work that evaluators perform and are critical to strengthening the evidence-based policy making that relies on the evaluation of impacts, outcomes, and outputs of development initiatives. Organized along the three stages of the knowledge creation chain, data collection, data analysis, and knowledge dissemination, this conference seeks to address the following questions. How are ICTs increasing the effectiveness and efficiency of evaluations? How can ICT tools contribute to enhance evaluation rigor, and what potential do they hold for the future? How can innovative approaches to disseminating enhance learning and strengthen impact? Despite these new possibilities, and true to the nature of evaluators, we need to exercise optimism with a tinge of caution. As evaluators, we need to be aware of the accompanying pitfalls that ICT may bring, such as concerns regarding privacy and inclusiveness. People-centric rather than technology-centric evaluations are the need of the hour, and ultimately, technology is just a tool for doing our work together. Evaluators, therefore, need to keep abreast of important developments in the field of ICT to stay at the cutting edge of innovation and to continue shaping the future of development evaluation. I encourage you to candidly share your experiences, which I hope will provide us all with the new ideas and approaches to meet the needs of poor people around the world. This is ICT for Eval. Thank you and enjoy the conference. Thank you very much, Oscar, for those strong messages about our responsibility to make sure that policy decisions should be based on facts uh, and uh, the message that you know, we need to be people-centered and technology uh, is a tool. Um, I'm going to do some housekeeping now before moving on to the next part of our um, agenda. Um, as you have seen in your program, the conference uh, has is a wealth of uh, has has very many uh, options. So we have a series of plenary sessions, and then we have a wealth of breakout groups. So, as Oscar just mentioned, is organized across three tracks. So we have the track for data collection, data analysis, and knowledge dissemination. You'll be able to explore all of these different dimensions through the plenary sessions and the breakout groups. And tomorrow, we we're going to have a tech fair, which is really the first time for IFAD, and you'll be able to also have a look at the technologies available. I also want to take a moment to welcome our virtual audience who are following us through the webcasting. For those of you who are in the room and are active on social media, please do post snippets and, uh, and sound bites using uh, 
the hashtag, which is just behind me, ICT for uh, eval. And for our virtual audience, if you have any questions for the panelists, you can post them using this hashtag. We have a number of social reporters in the room who will be gathering these questions and then fielding them uh, from the floor. So with the logistics out of the way, um, we're gonna get started with our two distinguished keynote speakers. Today's conference uh, will be an impetus to address issues such as how can existing technological solutions address the many challenges faced by the rural smallholder farmers. We're gonna be examining how evaluation and the development community part can partner with the private sector to create the necessary conditions uh, for an equitable access to ICTs. And how can development practitioners build capacity at local level um, so that institutions can manage an avail of data? And last but not least, how can we embed relevant, affordable, and scalable ICT activities in investment programs while also addressing the gender gap? So our hope is that by Wednesday, we have a better understanding of the opportunities and challenges within the ICT for eval space uh, and how this discipline can act uh, as a development worker's best ally and pave the way to bring about rural transformation. To get us started, uh, we have the pleasure of having Ms. Hashin Fu, the director of World Bank's uh, Development Data Group. In a world where we have 200 billion out of the 550 million, sorry, the 200 million out of the 550 million in developing countries engaged in agriculture, these people have mobile telephony and have access to one or another form of technology. Ms. Fu will talk about the power and potential of putting this data in people's hand and how new approaches can bring about change. Ms. Fu, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Good morning. Uh, what an honor and how, how humbling to be here with you all. Um, I, I see across the room uh, evaluation experts groups and experts on technology and uh, colleagues from the UN system and uh, private sectors. You know, I'm, I'm neither uh, expert on technology. You know, at home, I'm the one who constantly run to my teenagers for advice on my computers or phone apps uh, at, at, at work. Uh, I know Caroline, our VP on uh, independent evaluation, who's supposed to be here, she knows, you know, we're often on the other side being evaluated um, and res preparing our management response. Uh, so that's about how much I know about evaluation. So uh, I hesitated a lot uh, coming. But then I realized, what's the heck? You know, I'm really not here to impress you with what I know, but rather to share with you my passion and my enthusiasm about working together to explore the ways to move forward through openness and also through innovation. So with that in mind, uh, let me just share with you three thoughts I have based on the reflections I have on what we have been doing. Is that the way it works? Okay. So when we talk about um, data and technology, uh, perhaps what uh, often comes to our mind is uh, visualization as such. We all know over the past two decades, um, more than one billion people have been lifted out of extreme poverty. And this tree chart um, prepared by our group shows how the distribution of people living in uh, uh, extreme poverty changed over time across the world. We all know that um, the reduction of poverty is very pronounced, uh, most striking in East Asia and South, Southeast Asia. We know that uh, we have lived in a world with four in 10 people living in extreme poverty to now one in 10 still do. So those are very impressive headlines and those are the defining stories for, for institutions such as the World Bank. So we're very proud to have been able to present this big picture. But beneath this, there's millions or hundreds of thousands data points being collected over time to allow us to come to this understanding. So the first idea 
I would like to um, share is that technology is very much uh, uh, along the every step of the way of this data uh, cycle from production to dissemination to use. And, and technology has also increasingly transformed the way we do our business. Here, let's focus on one number, 35, which is the poverty headcount ratio in Uganda. Let's look at how this number come about. With that, I'd like to introduce my colleague Talib, who just joined us uh, a minute ago. Talib is actually working here in, in Rome at our Center for Development Data um, as part of our Living Standards and Measurement Study team, who works very closely with EFAT and FAO colleagues. Talib has been working very closely with uh, Uganda National Statistical Office to help them design and carry out household surveys. Actually, recently, Talib was featured in a documentary, uh, the, cloud, um, the Crowd and the Cloud. So what I'm going to present takes some of the information from that. So I gave them the credit. Here, what we see is once um, we decided what to measure and how to measure, we go to the field to get things down. In a country like Uganda, collecting information is extremely um, challenging, especially in rural and hard to reach areas. And this is where Talib get on the bus and travel down the road through the beautiful sceneries, but really getting to the heart of so many people's lives. Normally, um, when the uh, numerator is being um, uh, trained to administer the questionnaire, it takes about five to six hours uh, through multiple days in order to cover the hundreds of households being included in, in, in the household survey. Of course, in the past, it's really very much paper formed. So what is it that in terms of technology is helping us nowadays in this whole process? Tablets. We know now it's becoming very inexpensive, and um, combined with softwares as the ones that our team has developed, the so-called survey solutions that help us to design the questionnaire and to gather the information and send through cloud to a more centralized processing systems, we can really quickly get more higher quality information around the world. Nowadays, this uh, software and, and combined with tablets are being used in over 80 some countries that we're supporting. Also, GPS. Um, nowadays, of, often built into tablets now, that they help us as a very important tool to measure the distance between a household in a rural areas to services such as hospitals, schools, water, uh, uh, water points, and also can help us measure the area of land clouds. And that's what um, um, Talib and, and the team are using very intensively in, in, in the field. Satellite, we're also benefiting a lot. Um, here, for more detailed and frequent observations of large areas, we rely on satellite images um, to get estimates or information um, remotely um, captured. Um, this imagery presented here has been used to get estimates of everything from the area of our land plots to estimates of population size to how crops are growing as well as the materials on the roofs of a house uh, where those farmers are living so that we get a be better sense of their welfare. Drones is another thing that we're experimenting with a lot, and we can see that uh, not only there's uh, increasing expertise in how to efficiently use this tool, but also the cost has been uh, coming down fast. This really gave us the opportunity uh, for more higher resolution mapping and ad hoc data collection we could not otherwise, otherwise do. Sensor. Now, the te com telecommunications on computer hardware have becoming uh, much more inexpensive. Um, this makes it very possible to combine with low-cost sensors for monitoring everything from air and water quality to soil. And, and, and for example, uh, here, it's about measuring power outages. Uh, in Tajikistan, our team 
have designed cheap sensors built around mobile phones, which can be installed in your household in the rural areas to help monitor um, power outages throughout the day. So in a very short time, these devices have helped us to gather enough information to have a rich picture of the electricity availability um, in, across the country. So this has really helped us to re gauge the issue that of very high policy um, uh, relevance. Of course, we can't forget about big data, other big data sources such as metadata from uh, mobile phones are proving to be very useful, especially in, in situations where regular data collection is not uh, sustainable. Combined with existing data, it really gave us more current and more detailed perspective. And in this case, you can see that the population density um, um, uh, constructed on the left based on census data versus what's being uh, put together based on the mobile phone metadata from a um, um, telecom company, how similar they are and therefore offer us this hope that this kind of data sources could be used in other applications. It's really by exploring all of this new technology, um, we're able to really um, collect the kind of information that can be compiled and made available through, for example, here, the microdata catalog, uh, where the Uganda Household Survey is very prominently featured and can be accessed for further analysis, and also through increasingly more open analytical tools to allow the experts to really analyze the data and tease out the insight and share with, uh, more broadly with the public. So it's really from farm to tables, we bring those information together um, that allow us to come this far and present information in such a dynamic, visualized way and, and to really um, share both the success and failures in our development. But my next message is really about we have seen the potentials of technology and its applications. In a way, in, in the field of development data, we have been playing catch up with those technology and to see how we can best transform the way we're doing our business. But the problem is this has not been used more widely and uh, the potential has not been fully tapped. It's what we can do about this and why is the case. So it's really very much about the capacity and infrastructure, the human capacity and the institutional and technical capacity or infrastructure in many countries that have prevented them from taking advantage of those technology. One measure that reviews this is the statistical capacity indicator compiled by the World Bank. Here, it's really only for IDA countries, but you can already see how varied the strengths of national statistical systems are across the world and where the weakest national statistical system remain in Africa, where rural and agricultural uh, sectors still remain very mm -hmm. dominant in the economy. And those weak statistical system means that we don't have sufficient planning and, and the policy and legal framework as well as standard. And at the same time, we really lack the resources and expertise needed. And that also means a room like this, full of paper records, is still the norm in many countries, and, and the data are still collected very infrequently, even if when they do, the result will not be shared in time. So we really must invest in proving this data fair. But at the same time, we also need to in invest in the kind of partnership between public sectors and private sectors in order to find the better and cheaper solutions that we can really apply across the world. And here we can see that the Global Partnership for Sustainable Development Data, which has been formed um, in response to the call for data revolution under the SDG agenda, has gathered more than 200 partners and we're very proud to be part of this. And the goal of this is really to bring civil societies, academia, government and private sector together to identify and test and scale the kind of solutions that are most promising. 
And in the past year, we have been channeling some financing to support development data innovation project. The 10 projects we're currently funding range from improving vital registrations in, uh, among uh, uh, refugees in, uh, in Lebanon, Syrian refugees in Lebanon, to helping health workers uh, predict patient behaviors in Africa, to using low orbit satellites um, to detect illegal fishing in Southeast Asia. And those activities cover more than 20 countries. So this is only a starting point, but really it's very important that we work together to explore those potential applications and through the innovation to bring better data uh, together. Not only benefit evaluations, but also uh, go much beyond. The third and last point I want to stress is that we know that technology is involved in every st uh, step of the way in a data life cycle. We also know we must invest in, in the capacity of more countries to be able to take advantage of those technology through better uh, tools and methods. But we can't stop just at producing data. We must put them to better use. At the bank, we realized in 2010, uh, one of the best ways to allow better use of data is to open up, to reduce the barriers to access. This is why that um, through our open data initiative, um, we have been able to allow more widely access to the data uh, and knowledge that bank could publish. And um, I was told more than 60% of access to the bank's website is to the open data website. But we can remove the barrier to access, but what if you don't have the skill once you have access to use the data. This is why the, this is why the kind of data literacy programs that we have been working um, in countries, in this case is South Sudan, together with other development partners and donors, and, uh, such as DFID, are very important. What you can see here is um, a, a journalist uh, together trained with uh, government officials and academia after the training, he actually took the initiative, became, uh, began a trend of um, you know, data-driven journalism in order to help influence um, the policy making. But getting data used does not mean just to get the experts have the access to the data and use them, but rather to give the data to people in their own hand on the terms they want at the time and they, they find it's right for them to take the uh, appropriate actions. Whether it's a weather forecast on the radio or the election result uh, in, the, in the newspaper or market information on the mobile phone to allow small farm holders um, to, to make decisions. Um, what to do, or at the times it requires an influential uh, billionaire sharing the story of the fall of extreme poverty on social media, as what Bill Gates has done, really to help expand um, the, 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 the understanding of all of us about development impact. As Talib said, if you have chance to look at the document, you will see how powerful his, his message is. That is, every data point tells a human story. Technology is really helping us to bring that story from farm to table. But when those data are put in the right hand, each data point can change a human life. And in this case, I believe what we're doing can help the parents of this little girl to improve the food on their own dining table. So thank you very much. Thank you very, very much for that inspiring uh, uh, talk. Uh, um, you, absolutely. I think the, the, the message that every data point tells a story and every data point can change people's life is going to be something that we will carry forward to our, in, in the next two days uh, um, as we talk about the various dimensions uh, of, uh, of data. Um, thank you. That really was very, very inspiring. Thanks a lot. Um, and now, please join me in welcoming Dr. Uh, Jörg Hipokin, who is the Director of uh, Development Evaluation at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Finland. 
Dr. Putkin has decades of experience in this space, and he will take us on a journey showing us the importance of embedding ICTs from the outset and not as an afterthought. And he will also help demystify the sainthood cloud over big data. Dr. Pulkin, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much, Roxana. <clears throat> it was a good introduction. Um, I also wanted to sit there and, and listen to nice speeches uh, uh, these two days, uh, but uh, somehow I'm, I'm finding myself here <laughs> in the podium now. Um, I'm not a techie, uh, just like, like uh, Heisen said that, you know, that uh, my background might be in some of the technologies, but um, I don't feel like being techie anymore. I used to work very long time with ICT in education, uh, first as a uh, researcher and, and developer of the, one of the first uh, e-learning platforms, uh, web-based platforms in the 90s. And, and then, uh, and then uh, after that, uh, introducing myself uh, to uh, you know, the problems, uh, education problems in Africa and, and uh, developing countries. And somehow, uh, then you know, being a techie, uh, I just uh, felt that uh, okay, uh, there are a lot of nice solutions like, like mine, um, web-based learning. Um, uh, then uh, I felt somehow that uh, the e-learning research at the time, 20 years ago, was maybe uh, so trying to solve e-problems of e-learning, not the real problems of the life. So, uh, so that's uh, one of those. Uh, kind of uh, lessons learned, I, I learned from, from, from that experience. And of course, uh, now uh, I just want to uh, kind of you know, avoid of, of uh, looking at uh, uh, the same errors that we might have done uh, a long time ago, solving uh, e-problems of e-evaluation. Uh, uh, Do we have e-evaluation? No, not yet. Maybe in the future. Just like e-learning. Well, uh, after that, I, 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 sorry, I'm sure that my wife is saying good luck for the presentation. So <laughs> I switch it off now. Thank you. Um, I'm joined to the Minister of Foreign Affairs as an ICT for Development Advisor. So I, I think the developmental problems looked uh, much more, more interesting for me. and. Uh, I, I have been working for, for that uh, field for maybe 10 or no, 15 years already. And uh, then, uh, you know, uh, I learned a lot of, of those experience uh, of, of uh, kind of pushing uh, ICT solutions for development. At that, uh, that time, we were very eager to develop uh, millions of, of uh, kind of uh, solutions to solve uh, developmental problems, uh, poverty problems with ICT basically repeating exactly the same exercise that we did in education. And uh, just finding out that the most of the uh, solutions that governments and donors were offering uh, for development were not sustainable. Just when the, the initiative ended, uh, the prop, uh, basically the, uh, the use of ICT ended at the same time. So, um, and uh, Somehow, I, I, I felt that you know we don't necessarily uh, want to look the ICT solutions as such, but uh, looking the innovation side of, of you know, and, and uh, looking how uh, how we can enable ICT-based in innovations and let the uh, let the users and uh, the stakeholders invent themselves what are the solutions they want to use, and not the government to decide you know the solutions on behalf of them. And now um, I find myself here <laughs> in the podium to telling you about ICT in evaluation. I'm, I'm now the commissioner of the evaluations. I'm not, I'm not the techie anymore. I'm, I have done some evaluation by myself, but uh, I'm giving the orders for the consultants to do the evaluations and, and paying the bill in the end. And, and uh, so uh, that's a kind of business uh, that uh, uh, ICT doesn't play a very big role in practice. Uh, but uh, the, I'm, I'm quite interested still to use uh, ICTs in, in evaluation, and, and I, I, I would like to share some of my own experiences of, you know, maybe relieving my, my uh, failures at the same time, that, you know, it's, it's not always easy. Even, even you are willing to do that, even you know the solutions, 
but still you are not able to, uh, to do the, um, uh, use the ICT. Um, there are millions of ways of do, uh, using ICT in, in different, uh, different parts of the evaluations. That's, that's always the truth. But uh, somehow, uh, I think we should avoid to see ICT also as, as a solution to everything. You know this old saying that if, if the hammer is the only tool you have, all the problems look like nails. And so, uh, you know, they are, but you know, looking the other way around, you know, what are the real problems of, of evaluation and what then, what are the real right tools to pick up uh, for, for those uh, solutions, the problems. So uh, I will share, or maybe I, I could say, that, like uh, Hazen said, what the heck, <laughs> I'm here to share some of my, my own experiences. And then uh, I will share again uh, three of, uh, of my own experiences. One is a little bit older. It was it's going back to uh, maybe five, six years ago when I, I, I participated uh, one of the, the, the uh, ICT for rural development programs that Finland was funding through uh, Asian Development Bank. It was based on the kind of uh, uh, telecenter model that was uh, quite, quite much used on that time. I'm not sure if that is still used, but, uh, but the kind of telecenter model where you are setting up telecenters in rural uh, environment and then uh, kind of offering uh, all kind of services uh, that farmers uh, uh, really require. It's kind of you know uh, information about the seas or markets, market prices, or you know ordering some some fertilizers, whatever. And you know sometimes they work, sometimes not. But uh, I, I was not part of the program, but I was I was participating in the evaluation mission uh, on behalf of the government because we wanted to see also that how it goes. And uh, so I, 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 I was uh, uh, not doing the evaluation, but following it. And, and um, although the, I had kind of you know, a good picture of, of the program, how it uh, is supposed to go, and, and uh, basically in many times it, it, is, it was like, uh, like uh, the paper to, uh, and the plans actually explained. But I also realized one of the kind of uh, problem is that those who designed the program in the first place had never thought about evaluation in the end. Not paid any attention on, on the evaluation whatsoever. So uh, we traveled quite long distances to, to visit uh, most of the telecenters and uh, then uh, you know, looking at the nice equipment there, a lot of computers, maybe some cell phones as well uh, used uh, for, for the, uh, the purpose of the program. And then uh, uh, realizing that, uh, at least for me, it was kind of you know surprise that the, all the logbooks, all the monitoring data, all the information that was gathered from from the users of the telecenter, were handwritten in, on papers, printed by computers, <laughs> though, but uh, the forms and then filled in by 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 hand. So the evaluator, uh, the job of the evaluator was to collect all that paper in paper-based information retype it back to the computer and then uh, uh, <laughs> process it with the computer. So I, uh, you know, uh, of course we could say that you know, uh, ICT in evaluation is like that, you know, you are going around, interview, fill the forms, uh, retype the information, retype your, your uh, uh, interviews, etc., etc. But I'm, I'm not sure if, if we want to uh, uh, understand the use of ICT in evaluation like that. It's just normal use of, of computers in, in the reporting of, of the evaluation. Even the collection of the data by, by just recording everything uh, by, by, uh, by your laptop, uh, more that is use of ICT, but not very innovative anymore. So uh, what I, I kind of realized later on when I, I stepped in as, as a, a commissioner of, of the evaluations, director of evaluation unit, is that you know, most of the most important decisions on the use of ICT in data collection and the processing of, of, of that data in evaluations are done long before the evaluation starts. It's always, most of the cases, it's done when the, the uh, intervention is designed. And the problem is that uh, you as an evaluator or evaluation commissioner, you are not part of that process. They don't invite you and in most of the cases you don't want even to go because you want to be independent evaluator. You don't want to be involved too much on uh, program design. 
then you are evaluating your own own work. So we have a problem here. <laughs> how, do, how to inform our colleagues who are responsible of program design uh, so that they also understand uh, the need of, of the evaluation uh, in the end of the evaluation or in end of the program or during the program if you are uh, uh, applying different uh, approaches in evaluation. So this is quite an important problem, you know, uh, and it, we have tried to solve the problem, of course, at the ministries that, you know, we constantly communicate with the people and we are participating part of the decision-making process as well. But it's very hard work to influence them uh, and, and, uh, and, and remembering that, uh, that uh, part of the project cycle is also the evaluation in the end. And you have to worry about it in the beginning, not in the end. It's too late. Uh, second um, kind of case that I, I thought I, I, it, it's good to share because there's a lot of discussion about big data nowadays. It's a lot of you know new uh, cloud computing and uh, uh, kind of uh, machine learning, uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, every time I'm, I'm meeting uh, some of my colleague techies, uh, uh, you know, who are still in the, in the ICTs, they are proposing me that, you know, why don't we use this and this solution because it's, it's so efficient and, and so on and so. So uh, we, have, we are now commissioning this year a very important uh, evaluation for the government. It's about uh, gender equality. Uh, and uh, that is the topic that Finland has been supporting and pushing uh, in, in all the arenas for uh, maybe 20 years, even if not longer. So it's one of the, the priorities of Finland uh, for a long time. So uh, this is an evaluation that I don't want to experiment. You know, I have to have a very robust results in the, in the evaluation. So, uh, but you know, it's really important to, to get those results uh, back to the government, and, and uh, not only for, for accountability, but also for learning. So um, uh, to make sure that you know, uh, the evaluation is, is, is really good, I, I did the kind of evaluability st study in the beginning that, OK, let's see you know, what is available, how, how to evaluate how to evaluate this kind of you know, uh, cross-cutting theme that uh, Finland has been uh, supporting for a long time. And uh, maybe it was not a surprise, but you know, surprising, uh, somehow surprising was that uh, there, there is no follow-up data at all. Nobody had followed it up, nobody had reported, no, no, nobody had monitored it, uh, it, it properly. Or maybe they had, but you know, they, maybe they had uh, all their notes somewhere in their own computers, and then when they resigned, you know, they have taken the notes with them, and then nobody finds them anymore. So, so we have a problem. <laughs> we have a real problem, not e problem, but you know, we have a real problem here. That uh, I have a very important evaluation topic to be evaluated, and then there's no monitoring data at all, or if something, you know, that's re really anecdotal evidence that we have. And not even old evaluations. Uh, somehow uh, cross-cutting. This is a kind of you know advice for you. You know what is uh, you know whenever you have very important topic uh, or, uh, or kind of policy goal as a cross-cutting objective, most probably nobody is doing it properly. Nobody is following it properly. Nobody is evaluating it properly. So it's <laughs> just a warning that you know that can happen. At the, at least it happened to us. Uh, it's nobody's fault, you know, just uh, the nature of cross-cutting is, is, is quite challenging. So, um, having read uh, really interesting uh, kind of, you know, experience of, of uh, global, uh, UN Global Pulse, uh, for example, the using, um, uh, using uh, uh, big data for, for, uh, for evaluating gender equality in some context, uh, so it's, uh, I was kind of, you know, uh, saying hooray! Now I have a problem that I can solve it uh, with uh, with, uh, with <laughs> big data or cloud computing or you know whatever. So uh, let's do it. Let's let's uh, let's explore those uh, you know, possibilities that we know because we, I have no data, but it, maybe there is some data somewhere in the clouds that I can use instead of, of the monitoring data. So. Um, I, first, I looked at uh, Google Trends. That's good, uh, you know, if you want to see, you know, what is happening and then what pe information people are uh, searching. If, if you want to see that, you know, what are the trends in, in people's mind, and, you know, most probably they are searching information uh, um, on, on those ideas. I also want to see that, you know, uh, whether there are some information on Google Trends 
on those topics that were interest, uh, kind of important for Finnish, Finnish government on, on, on the, uh, gender equality. And uh, okay, if I you look the, uh, at the global level, there are there are really something that you know that there are trends on those topics that you can see that okay that follows. Uh, uh, those are the topics that uh, people are interesting, uh, interested on, on, on gender equality. But when you go to Africa, and when you go to those individual countries that uh, your programs are running, then you have a problem. There's no data enough to make any, any kind of uh, predictions or any kind of analysis, or no, no trends visible. It might be that, that you know, there, is, there really is no information enough but uh, there might be also some technicalities that, uh, that we know that uh, some of the internet exchange points that uh, are redirecting the, the, the internet traffic are not uh, all well developed in Africa yet. And then if you go back, uh, let's say, five, six years, there are a lot of problems on that, that sector um, in, in the internet uh, infrastructure. So there, it, there might be that they, even there are information, there is no homeland for that in information. And of course, you know, after that, there are also many other other technical problems. Uh, some uh, some problems that you know, do we know who the people that are actually who are searching information? Are they men or are they female? Just like uh, UN uh, Global Pulse, there you have to have some uh, extra extra <laughs> applications to find out who the heck the people are, and so on. So so there is uh, you know, but you know, even even looking from the data uh, availability point of view, the, uh, when you look Africa. Uh, there might be some problems to use uh, big data, at least the social media big data. Uh, yeah, thank you. So uh, that's uh, my, my kind of uh, problem of using uh, big data, uh, although I, I was really eager, but I, I still believe that big data is something that we are supposed to use and we are, we are using in the future, but you know, not necessarily to solve those problems that we currently have, but maybe those other problems that we might actually have in the, in the future. We can't follow the data, actually. We have to follow the problems and questions that we have in the evaluation. Uh, so uh, that sometimes the answer is there, sometimes not. Then uh, finally, I, I, I would like to come to uh, those uh, experiments that I, I have, I have uh, more experience, is to use ICT for, for learning purposes. Most of the uh, times evaluation is about learning, so I think the, uh, those technologies that are used for e-learning are still relevant for, for evaluation purposes. And uh, all kinds of solutions, web-based learning, uh, webinars, uh, video conferencing, they are really, really technologies that are easy to use. And they are also uh, increasing the impact of the evaluation. That's the most important. They are increasing the impact of the evaluations because they are broadening the access to evaluation uh, uh, data. And uh, so uh, if nobody reads the evaluation, it is no use to do the evaluation. If the evaluation is not impacting the practices, it's no use to do the evaluation. So uh, I think uh, using uh, technologies that are used for, uh, for e-learning can be used for dissemination of the, uh, of the evaluation results. And I think there is a session even on, on that. Um, there are many other ideas on innovation, innovation and, and the use of ICT uh, in, in uh, evaluation. But always uh, the, the most difficult, difficult is to right, uh, find the right, right innovations and, and right innovative ideas. Um, we have to remember. We have to remember the, the, uh, the uh, what, uh, what Albert Einstein actually said about innovative ideas, and that's very difficult to apply in the practice. He said that if at first the idea is not absurd, then there is no hope for it. So let's see what kind of innovative ideas we have during the two days. And if they, found, if they uh, sound absurd or not, but let's li try to learn together. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. And yes, indeed, we, we would love to hear all the absurd ideas so that uh, together we can bring about innovation. I'm going to now open to questions and comments to, the, um, to our keynote speakers. Uh, 
just raise your hand and you'll be provided with a microphone, introduce who you are, and try and pose your question as succinctly as possible so that we can take as many questions as possible. The floor is yours. So, so who would like to break the ice? Yes, sir. Is that working? I'm not sure that's working. Oh, really? Um, my question mainly is about learning. Well, firstly, thank you very much for the talks. They were very, very useful, everyone. My question is about uh, learning. Obviously, w globally, we've got a whole lot of different organizations here. We're all capturing learning. It's mainly, my concern has always been about how we, sh a point you made, it's about sharing the learning, actually learning from it. Because evaluations get put on uh, websites. Do people actually download them? Doubtful. Do people learn from them? Again, doubtful. So it's, that's one of the main challenges I feel, sort of how we actually get all the learning together from us here and bring it together. Because rather than just doing our own thing, and any ideas you may have on that, I think that's what I wanted to find out about. Thank you. Let's take another question, and then we'll go uh, to, to our speakers. Anyone else? Oh, yes, 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 Maria. Thank you for the presentation. I'm Maria Hartl, Senior Technical Specialist on Gender in IFAD. I would like to ask uh, a question to Mr. Pulkinen, because I was very um, sympathetic of your concern, how to evaluate gender now, but you kind of stopped before you told us actually what you're using now. So I would be most curious to hear how you're resolving this question now, if you don't find it on the Google, and if you don't find it in the, if the, the data has not been disaggregated by sex. Thank you, Maria. Yes, ma'am. Um, so I was wondering whether um, you could share what all of your organizations are doing when it comes to looking at how you're selecting the appropriate technology, but also how you're looking at how you're appropriately using the technology. So the ethics, the inclusivity, the data protection, and ensuring that we're protecting the citizens, you know, of the people that we're collecting the data from. So how are you looking at the methodology of how ICTs are actually used for evaluation in your organizations? Okay, uh, let me, let's go to our keynote speakers and then we'll come back to the floor. So the, the first question, sharing of learning. Um, that's absolutely, you're absolutely right, sir. We do not learn, uh, we, we don't seem to learn because we never unlearn. If we unlearn, we'll be able to learn, but if we don't, we don't. Uh, and I'm, I'm sure Caroline can talk about this uh, tomorrow when they did the, the whole uh, evaluation of uh, how many people actually downloaded the World Bank documents, the PDFs, and the answer was perhaps minus, minus 200. But I don't know, <laughs> it was like, it was <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't very much, but we know that the PDFs are not being read. So I'm going to turn to Haishan uh, if you want to take that question. Thank you very much. Um, it, it's absolutely critical uh, how we learn together. But that's why I want to take the, this opportunity to again commend Oscar for convening this. This is a learning forum for us to really come together to share ideas and share what we have been doing and, and also to inspire each other and stimulate each other's thinking. But at the same time, um, I think it's also, in, I think you, you, you really put your finger on the pause is that through what forms learning can happen. And we cannot expect um, putting things in PDF forms and that will be done. We have to really share the information to with people on their terms, meaning what can they absorb and what can they learn. So I think this, I hope this next two days will give us a lot of ideas of how we can do better on that. And just very quickly on the last question, if I may, um, indeed it's not about, uh, as I mentioned in, in the presentation, that I feel that I'm in a profession where constantly looking at what have already happened and, and in terms of technology, we keep on chasing what's out there rather than dictating what kind of te technology will allow us to do what we're doing best. 
but here I think um, selecting the technology is really about um, finding out what questions we want to solve and see what solutions might be the most appropriate. Um, at the same time, I think it, the issue of using the technology and using what's being generated responsibly by taking care of the issue of uh, uh, confidentiality and, and other uh, uh, sensitivities is so important. Um, I don't think this is one organization's job. It's, it's really a collective uh, uh, task that we need to do, um, both in terms of how we access the data. Uh, individual bilateral bargaining is not enough. You know, there has to be collective bargaining in terms of how we access, um, for example, data that are held in the private sectors and how we take care of some of the sensitive legal issues uh, and defining the root of the game together so that there will be a broader space for us to, to, um, to work on. At the same time, we don't... Uh, uh, Open data means we release information in open forms, which is not PDF. It has to be um, machine uh, readable and can be used in its, with its flexibility. So that's very important to keep in mind. Thank you. Dr. Pukin, you want to take Maria's question? Yeah, actually, um, I would like to touch first uh, the uh, information uh, sharing. Uh, I did have that in my notes, but because I don't, never follow my notes, <laughs> So um, I, I skipped it. Uh, so uh, there are uh, some sharing platform, platforms like, uh, uh, like OECD, uh, Evalnet. They, they are collecting a lot of lessons learned from, uh, from evaluations that we are doing worldwide. But, uh, and then, uh, you know, basically there are PDF documents, but that's not necessarily the solution uh, that for, for that, uh, you know, uh, you know, because PDFs are PDFs. It's, it's a kind of old-fashioned format. Imagine that you know, you know, in World Bank and the other big players are now uh, kind of uh, advocating the open data and, and uh, open data philosophy that you, got, you can follow, and ERT as well, uh, follow the, uh, the, uh, where the funding goes, you know, this kind of open funding initiative. And, and so, uh, but you know, there's not too much about the results and evaluations on that initiative. So if all the evaluation reports, not reports, but evaluation findings could be in a database that are contextualized uh, a database, actually, that, you know, uh, what they are related to, and they are following the same, uh, sa same standards and formats that, uh, uh, that uh, open data and uh, ERT formats are, are following. So basically, you could, could connect, actually, uh, all, all the evaluation re uh, results to those fundings, that, uh, the fund, fund flows that are, uh, are going to the, for the development. So uh, basically, then you could actually have a good searchable uh, database uh, for, for evaluation results. And it would be a, a kind of global uh, one. Just like, like in research, we have such, uh, such uh, databases available, not necessarily following the, the, uh, the ERT standards, but you know, that at least some standards that you can, you can see at least that, you know, what the others are doing. So uh, that, uh, um, it can be in cloud, it can be you know, big data, whatever, but you know, it will be uh, much more uh, useful than, than uh, PDFs. In gender evaluation, you know, that's, that's, that's the, the nice story, actually, that uh, you know, I, I, I have not done the decision yet you know, what technology to use or what methodologies to use. But uh, what I decided is that you know, I will commission it different ways. So first, I will commission it in a way that you know, I will, I'm going to hire a team leader first, and then, then team leader, a couple of team leader candidates who have to read the background information and material and also the evaluability study and then propose a feasible, feasible methodology for us. Because you know, uh, what comes in, in, in technologies and you know, uh, really recent technologies like, like uh, big data uh, analysis, I don't have any colleagues at the ministry who understand them. You know, that's uh, totally out of our kind of comprehension at the moment. So I have to hire somebody who understand. It's the best way, and basically there are not too many actually evaluators or team leaders who underst really understand also that, that uh, technology. So what I'm going to do is I'm, I'm first hiring a candidate for, for, for the uh, team leader and looking different uh, approaches and then uh, deciding with the team leader actually what is the approach and then hiring the rest of the team who understand exactly the methodology that I'm going to use. So uh, facing a little bit uh, uh, the old-fashioned uh, evaluation commissioning, we used to commission the whole package at once and then that's, you know, there's very little influence that the commissioner can do for, for uh, uh, this kind of uh, uh, decisions that what are the technologies that are used. 
for evaluation. So that's, that's, that's how it goes. Thank you. Oscar, any thoughts from you? It's very briefly on the question on learning and how can we learn out of evaluations because uh, we are all concerned and uh, of course the, the data that is coming from evaluations and perhaps I would follow the, the line that uh, Haishan had in her presentation that to say that give uh, data to people openly in their hands when needed. And in that sense uh, we also want to close the, 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 the feedback loops with our evaluations about how uh, our development programs, uh, projects, and uh, strategies are working, and trying to provide information about that. Does learning happen immediately after an evaluation is conducted? Sometimes yes, sometimes not. But what is important is to have access to that uh, knowledge, and therefore, uh, the use of ICT uh, really can enhance this accessibility to the information that is needed when it's needed to learn to take place. That would be my take out. Thank you. I'm still struggling to figure out how we can make our PDFs more learning friendly, but uh, yeah, that's, that's for another conference. Sir. Yeah, uh, I have one question because uh, date, data sounds so, well, let's say, evident. Uh, what do you think and what are your views on um, verification of data? What do you think of, uh, call it fake data, and political impact of providing data? I believe to a certain degree, if we are not verifying, and uh, we may face a very problematic situation. Uh, crap data, even if you collect them, are crap data at the end of the day. Um, thank you for that. Uh, sir, in the, the gentleman in orange, yes. Hello, yep. <coughs> I'd just like to follow up on, um, sorry, I'm David Galati from TechServe. Um, <coughs> and I'd like to follow up on the, the, the question of closing the loop between the use, the collection, um, and dissemination of data and feeding back into the design um, in, and investment process. Um, I, I know that the, the, the people in this room certainly are on the supply side of the data, uh, of the data market, so to speak. And I think we, we feel like once you've provided high quality data, I think we're, our job is done. And I think that we should probably change that thinking because unless there are incentives on the side of the, those who are gonna use the data, um, and there is a pull process where the, date, the, the format and the priorities on, on the data <coughs> regarding data um, are articulated by those who will use it and the incentives are there to make sure that data are driving investments, then I think we'll always have this problem where very high quality evaluations will end up sitting on, on the shelves. So rather than sort of saying, let's get the highest quality data out there, what we should be saying is, Let's bring in those who are the u primary users of that data and ask them what exactly are the kinds of evaluations, what kind of, the, of data are really the ones that are going to drive high quality decision making and investment. I think that's something I, I would challenge um, IFAD as, as you know, having an, an office of, of in, independent office of, of evaluation and also being on the, on the, on the investment side. Is that something that, that you'd be able to do as an organization or at least start to advance that kind of process um, uh, on a wider basis than it is right now? Okay, let's take one more. And sir, if you could introduce yourself and then we come back to the, to the panel. Uh, my name is Martin Barugahare. I work for UN Habitat, Nairobi, Kenya. Yes. ICTs can be really play a great role in monitoring and evaluation functions. Yes, technology is now here, but it is changing very fast. And we have the gap, the gaps he has said, that there are still gaps, though we have the technology which is advancing very fast. Now my concern is really how much do we invest in the rapid changing technology to fill the gaps that exist now in the present technology we have. The investment in terms of uh, capacity building, in terms of the type really 
tehnologie să surgi peste din. Thank you. Um, hi, Shan, may I ask you to address the, the, the question about the political impact uh, of using uh, um, perhaps data that has not been verified? Thank you. Um, I think in order to counter fake news, fake data, it's absolutely important for us to put the data in open forms in the hands of people. We will never be sufficient enough to be the one to verify, but we need to let them out and let more people have the skills and understanding of the data and be able to do that verification on a larger scale uh, in the public so that there will be a real um, counter force um, against those fake news and fake data. Open data and data literacy are really critical. And um, if I may take this opportunity just to respond to the last one in terms of filling data gaps. We know those technologies offering huge potentials, but they're not yet fully utilized to benefit from that. One part of it is I feel that so far we have been focusing on improving data as a standalone development initiative, rather not linking up to other development investment. For example, what do we mean by data revolution? Unless we really have digitized government administrative systems, we have more universal mobile access, and we collectively invest in geospatial data and allowing those different kind of data be linked and to tap into the depths of information they can provide, we will never be able to really generate enough information to fill the data gaps as currently. So we need to really link up to those other investment in ICT, in better governance, in you know, the, the universal mobile access, in order to really generate the kind of data architecture we need to, to have the information be um, um, uh, created through those different sources on a time, a real-time basis. Um, so I, I think we really need to think broader than just investing data per se, but rather a broader linked development uh, initiatives. Thank you. Oscar, if you don't mind answering the, the question on closing the loop. I'm happy to take the challenge, of course, yes. Um, you know, in the United Nations, we have an evaluation group that puts together the evaluation offices of the uh, different entities of the system. And as part of that, we have a subgroup uh, trying to uh, work on how to enhance the use of evaluation. And one of the findings of our studies was that uh, evaluation use is better enhanced by stakeholder participation. When, uh, precisely as the gentleman uh, mentioned, when we uh, integrate the stakeholders in, as part of the evaluation process to better understand the demand side and not only the supply side, if you want. So principles for stakeholder engagement are not new and are used in evaluation uh, for a long time. However, uh, the opportunities brought uh, to us by the use of information and communication technologies really expand this concept much, much more broadly. What does it mean? How can we use ICT for really closing this learning loop and not only reaching the end beneficiaries uh, of the different uh, development interventions of our institutions, but also shortening the time and the feedback loop. I mean, uh, and we will have uh, dedicated sessions on that uh, the next two days where we will learn from the front runners, really trying to, to see what are they doing, what are the mistakes that they are uh, uh, making, right, in order to also learn from our mistakes. Thank you. Thank you. I know there are some more questions from the floor. So, uh, yes, Michael. If you just introduce yourself. Uh, good morning, everybody. I'm M Michael Bamberger, um, independent uh, evaluation consultant. Um, I I'd ask it, invite everybody, when listening to all of these presentations, to think when are we actually talking about evaluation? There's a lot of the examples about how information can be collected, how it can be analyzed, but very often, as was pointed out, the evaluation function doesn't come in until later on. So the evaluator very often is looking at data which is being collected for a different purpose. Can we use it for evaluation? So I, I hope that we're going to be 
learning about situations in, when the, in which this technology is specifically being designed for evaluation. Um, one, one of the issues, I think, which is going to come up, we're going to find it, it's quite difficult to get these good examples. It's almost evaluation, but not quite. So I look forward to hearing from all of I think everybody in this room shares the information which exists on this. So I look forward to, to learning from you all. So thank you. Okay, thank you. If you want to just pass it to a gentleman next to you, and sir, if you could please introduce yourself. Well, th thank you very much, uh, Roxana. My name is Ni Kwekuma. I'm from the Permanent Representation of Ghana. Um, I'll just comment on two issues. Um, the first one is related to uh, the download of the PDFs, etc. I, 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 I'm just reflecting on it, and I was just thinking. Um, we don't always buy books, and we go to the uh, library to read. We don't always borrow. The important thing is that information that will be put out there, let's say on the World Bank website, uh, I can access it, read it, utilize it, learn from it, but never download it because if I have reliable internet and I know that any time I can go in there, that is fine. So don't worry too much about the data or the PDFs not being downloaded. Truth of the matter is how many people are referring to it and using it for, uh, per, uh, for the purposes. My second comment is on um, uh, the, the latter stages of the president's uh, presentation, uh, which uh, had to do with uh, the divide between users and developers of technology. And um, reflecting further, I, I, I think that knowing the work that the uh, developers do, they, 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 they target. They, they, they really target a particular audience. So they, they have a lot of research and development to guide them. And that is where they put um, their, their development. But w in terms of us and what we want, I think that we can also make a request for the, 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 the developers to put in place technologies that we can use to our advantage. So I think it is important. Uh, the, the, two, the two divides will continue to exist but we have to be more proactive in asking for what we want. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Um, and Paolo, if you Th introduce yourself. Thank you, Roxy. Uh, Paolo Silveri, uh, Country Program Manager for Brazil, for IFAD, and former Evaluation Officer at IFAD. Thank you for the inspiring conversation today. Uh, there has been, uh, it has been mentioned that uh, the technology is uh, available, but unevenly distributed and the access has, uh, is uneven as well. Um, <clears throat> also, uh, Ms. Haishan Fu presented various tools that exist uh, that can be applied to data collection, GPS, drones, uh, mobile phones, tablets, etc. Uh, having in mind uh, the areas where IFAD has its projects, which are the most isolated ones, is there uh, any of the institutions present has developed a map of where uh, some of these technologies can be used and where they can't? A map of countries or perhaps sub-regions within countries where we would know that a range of these technologies available can be used and another range cannot be used. Uh, I, I'm not sure if my question is clear, but basically having a, a an up-to-date picture of what can be used where nowadays. Is it available or not? Thank you very much. Thank you. Let me go to Dr. Polkin. So if you want to take any, uh, uh, any of the questions, uh, and then we go to Hashan Fu, because uh, I am conscious of time, and we, uh, we, need to, uh, we need to wrap this session up. Thank you, Roxana. Maybe a little bit related to this, the last question that you know, but is available. Uh, and, and of course, there are a lot of uh, experiments going on uh, everywhere. But you know, as a commissioner, it, you have to be very careful, because if if you somehow lose the trust of your evaluations at the government or your your, your parliament is is saying that okay, you know, it's nice evaluation, but you know, this crap information inside or you know, all the, the tools you are used, you know, they are not relevant at all, you know, so that, that doesn't really uh, kind of answer the problem that you had in the first place. That is a problem. That's a big problem. You know, it's, it's questioning the whole evaluation function at the ministry if, if I can't serve them with, with really reliable uh, products. 
in. And so uh, I think the, the base, uh, space for experiments and then space for, for uh, provi providing evaluations that uh, really have an impact in the policy level. Uh, uh, so that's uh, somehow difficult to put together in the same, same place. Of course, also the resources are limited at, you know, to do evaluation. So, uh, so that uh, kind of you know, limits a little bit the experimental spirit of yours. <laughs> uh, so, but you know, there might be a really good uh, some, uh, something that available. I don't know where, but you know, that, uh, that is somewhere. Coming back to the crap, uh, crap data, you know, I, I think uh, <laughs> that's always, it, uh, evaluation is not science, although I try to use scientific methods, uh, but you know, it's always about uh, you know, giving a value for, to something, and, and it's, it's based on the information that is available about that. Sometimes it's crap, sometimes not, but not, not, uh, never a kind of scientific, and, and we should actually not look at evaluation as a science. But still, I think you know, uh, having the loop, uh, you know, you use the use the uh, the, the results uh, of of the evaluation, and validating at them at the same time, you know, it's, that's that's where uh, ICD can can come into the picture. You know, what how we have done it is that we are using video conferencing, Skype, uh, whatever technologies to to bring the stakeholders and beneficiaries together to, in validation sessions. Because you know, uh, in, in, uh, uh, you know, when uh, the evaluators come to, uh, from different countries, you know, it's very difficult to speak uh, with the stakeholders anymore. But you know, uh, with, with just normal uh, technologies, we can we can still extend our meetings for them, and, and then they can validate whether the information was valid or not. At the same time, it's not only validating, but it's all about learning. Many times, the stakeholders are applying those lessons learned right away on their, their, their uh, own operations. They don't wait the PDF document to come out. They start thinking immediately. So that's why I think, you know, from validation point of view, but also from learning point of view, it's good to use those technologies for, for, uh, for validation session. And also, of course, the dissemination later on. Thank you. Hasha? Thank you. Um, I just want to really acknowledge the question raised by Michael. I think it's absolutely critical. And it's also reminded me of a conversation I had with some uh, UNDP evaluation colleagues. One, the whole discussion of the SDG indicator indicators was at its depth, you know. I think we, we talked about um, whether why the evaluation M and E community is left out in that discussion, and um, the whole focus on generating data to monitor progress globally, rather than the kind of information required for us to really evaluate the impact of, of different policies and program, especially under this whole new uh, SDG uh, program, and, and how we help to course correction the, our, our, our policies and programs is so important. This raised two questions. It's one, how as a community um, we should be much more proactive in influencing what kind of technology could be used to generate what kind of data that is outside the mainstreams of national statistical systems so that we will be able to do a better job. Second is that with the new kind of information or data becoming more increasingly available, what, is, what are their potentials? I know this is a very contentious question. Even just yesterday at the dinner, uh, uh, cocktail happy hours that there's very heated exchange on this but this fundamentally um, ask us as a community as an intellectual um, uh, group professional group how we can more critically evaluate our mode of operation, our paradigm, our, our framework to see whether there's anything required fundamental change uh, rather than just continue with how we know it. Um, so we really need to think on both sides that how as an evaluation community we can help f promote the application of ICT for what purposes and how we are going to do our business moving forward. Thank you. Oscar? After those words, uh, I have very little to add, so over to you. Okay, um, well, thank you very much, everyone. This is just the beginning, so as you can see, you're going to have an exciting uh, two days. So